and I'm here basically because Yorick and I are uh, determinedly making mischief um, on other projects and we've talked about this whole issue of choices that we all face and, um, and we're dealing with these same sorts of issues in Weybridge which has similarities and dissimilarities but I'm talking more about the general background of the choices we're making and how brave we might choose to be or wish to be and just to think how much choice we actually do have so it's not about you two um, I just thought as I was wondering what to say to you about this issue about being on the edge and being original having an edge and uh, and whether we are on the edge, and whether advantages and disadvantages of that um, of that situation, and at various times in history, clearly, people have here felt themselves to be at the periphery. Other times, they have not. They felt themselves to be in the centre of their world. Perhaps in the twentieth century, there's been a sense about being at the periphery here because. Centralisation and the sorts of transport links made people feel perhaps frustrated that they couldn't get where they wanted to. But of course in other periods of history, especially St. Ives, was absolutely at the centre of the world because being at the edge was a huge advantage in terms of just being able to get anywhere at the standard six knots that ships go, which led to the most extraordinary global reach for these, for these communities. So it's, it's that kind of uh, sense and context. And as I was thinking about what to say here, I just just had this, I think an image is quite long, I just sort of had this sense about whether we're a bit reverential in Cornwall and feel overwhelmed by both the mythic past and the extraordinary achievements of earlier eras and can have a sense of floundering around and having no prospect of actually doing things of the same sort of uh, scale. And I'll come back to that, that's another thing I was thinking about when I was trying to decide what I could learn from talking to you and thinking about the things that we are doing. Essentially these are choices and there's no sense of value, one is better than the other, the past and the future have any different valuation and that uh, whether being at the centre or the periphery um, is, is preferable, there are clearly huge uh, merits in all of them, but there are issues about where we choose to place ourselves in terms of, um, of those kinds of choices and, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, detail once I've uh, gone around the hoops a bit about myself. I'm actually medically qualified and worked in anthropology and, and medicine and, and in international health so I'm now dealing with kind of development issues and so on which may seem a bit frivolous but, but of course development and health are just completely intertwined so throughout the work I've done those things have been intertwined. These people are in a low energy environment that makes them stunted, have very low life expectancy and, um, it's, and energy issues are actually fatal for younger people. Childhood mortality is essentially an energy related issue and people there mourn in white rather than black. This is in the Eastern Highlands of New Guinea but um, and then we can also learn from, from poorer countries. In this particular hospital that I ran, the cold chain for dealing with vaccines failed a lot because we ran out of kerosene, which was just, couldn't get their hands on it and it's expensive. But we had a lot of water, sunshine and shit. So by combining these, uh, these three ingredients, that that black tank is um, made out of the Detroit steel, the whole North Guinea coast, every five or eight hundred meters there's a landing craft from the 1945 landings with a very high quality steel so we carved the gasometer lid out of one of these landing crafts and, um, and that's an aerial view with the hospital laboratories and then uh, runs through oxidation uh, through the digester, through oxidation ponds and then into um, fish ponds, produce ducks, fish, subsoil um, fertilization for gardens so you can grow beans in about six weeks on bare sand, and critically gas for lighting and for running the fridges. So, um, and exactly the same sort of solutions are available to us now if we choose to adopt them. That's how we live ourselves, basically harnessing energy in various ways and uh, breeding rare breed 
stocking up the things. If anybody wants some of the best uh, pork or um, dexter beef uh, they'll ever get hold of, then they can uh, talk to us after us. Um, and in terms of my um, things I do round and about, I work in Exeter University, I have a visiting chair there, and I'm involved in um, Smart Cornwall, I'm on the steering group, and I'm a board member of the, um, the local nature partnership. So that's kind of things I do at the moment, and my background is in epidemiology and anthropology. The, a lot of men here could well benefit from work that we did that uh, basically showed the um, danger of prostate cancer screening and, um, and, the, uh, and the high risks of intervention too early. Um, and uh, so there's a range of, of activities I've been involved in, including being involved in, um, in policy and, and setting up the NHS R&D systems. That's where I'm kind of coming from. And this focus on energy, why have I and others focused on energy? And there's a set of issues that face us all and would be the same here, as in most towns in Cornwall, people don't really appreciate that the demography of many of these towns is, each of them is actually very similar. The surface impressions are very misleading. And um, so we're still one of the poorest parts of uh, Europe, which is shameful, and uh, we get more money because that's the prize for failure from previous rounds. There's real problems in um, talented folks staying around. It's hard to get um, support for new businesses. But the key thing about energy is just the sheer financial flows that it represents. It's a million pounds per thousand people per year. So that's um, slick Willie Sutton down the bottom who didn't actually say when he was asked why do you rob the banks because that's where the money is. It was a journalist made up the quote for him. But nevertheless, I put that picture up there. Does anybody think there's any kind of striking resemblance between Willie Sutton and any prominent political figure? <laughs> Uh, is currently making uh, an it's impact. Right, isn't it? yeah, extraordinary, isn't it? But uh, there you go. Um, but um, so the issue with energy, quite apart from questions of, of climate change and other things that it seems mm. odd not to take seriously when we are living in places that are exposed to the implications, um, is just sheer financial volume that energy represents. And the sorts of solutions that are offered just do not seem to help centrally generated solutions. So, so our approach is basically to turn the whole issue on its head and start from the other end. It's recognised that there are serious issues here, but it's not very clear what the solutions should be. <clears throat> the public discourse is confusing, but that is because it is completely confused and uh, it is not possible to make sense of the various conflicting statements. The, are we bothered about climate change or not? It's not clear. Are we trying to decarbonise or not? It's not clear. Are we trying to decentralise or distribute energy supplies? It's not clear. How technology became party political is a complete mystery. But nevertheless, uh, wind and solar are somehow sort of labour and a bit lib... Dem and fracking and nuclear seem to be um, um, conservative, so that's very mysterious. And um, are we looking for competitive approaches or collaborative approaches? Do we actually want to deal with the bewildering inefficiency of our housing stock or not? And so on. It's just um, these things just don't make sense. And, uh, and of course, it's actually about power in the political sense rather than, um, than power in terms of the energy sense. So it may be worth engaging in the conversation and reading about it, but to some extent that is almost irrelevant. And it may be better just to leave that discussion to those kind of folks and start at completely the other end and see what we can do in our localities and neighbourhoods and where the autonomy may be to do something about these issues and to kind of pose the questions in, in relatively um, understandable terms. So um, that's actually to do with water, but the same sort of thing applies to energy. We're surrounded by sources. So I won't actually ask you to, to vote on the, on the question, but that's the kind of, 
kind of questions that, um, that we can ask. And the fact is that the kinds of local things that we can do have a very powerful potential impact. And the number of reasons for that, and perhaps the most fundamental, is that energy is simply a summary of what people choose to do. So the idea that you can somehow make an impact on energy flows and the energy economy without involving people is completely fanciful. So the first key reason why local approaches matter is that it's, it's our energy, it's what we choose to do. And it's also our money. So this is Weybridge, yours will be about the same. You've got 10,000 population more or less? No, so the same kind of thing. So that, that's the kind of uh, amount that's going out of, out of your population every year. I'd say your tourist spend is probably, um, tourist income is probably higher than, than ours, so the energy spend may equate to the tourist income, but is that really what you want to spend all your money on? Because within a local energy market, which is completely amenable to its creation, a large proportion of those energy flows are actually returnable and we can come to ways in which that is possible. So some things are absolutely given. The environmental charges have actually just been about to be docked off, so they don't exist at all because um, the big six have managed to dump them. But, um, but the larger proportion of these uh, financial flows are returnable to the locality if different arrangements were in place. And Cornwall could have been created as an infrastructure for these kinds of developments. It's very interesting, it uh, industrialised but didn't urbanise. So we have population foci with a hinterland that's just given to generation. So the sorts of technological arrangements which are completely available essentially involve islanding populations. So you have you know, actual islands, but you have essentially microgrids that interconnect in various ways. So much of the time they're relatively autonomous but complemented by centralised systems. And you can just drop that set of arrangements onto Cornwall. It was just made for it. And um, so quite apart from the extraordinary renewable resources we have and the fact that many parts of Cornwall are really up for change and want to get more grip on these things, um, unusually for people with aspirations of this sort, there is also an astonishing wall of money coming down that can be used for these purposes because uh, the point about uh, EU funding is public money to de-risk private investment so the potential, potential leverage upon private investment from that source of funding is quite extraordinary so this is a completely realistic uh, prospect and so as I've said the technologies are available as a matter of doing something about it the fact is there's a kind of filibuster going on that sustains the centralised arrangements so the, the kind of incoherent discussions are very similar to other kinds of discussions in areas which should change but don't. And the most uh, <coughs> obvious example where these kinds of techniques were most refined was the tobacco industry dealing with the unequivocal evidence that tobacco had uh, adverse effects upon health, which, is, which was quite clear by the 50s. And so the techniques involve creating uncertainty where there actually is none, and, um, and creating a sense of, of complexity of implementation where there's none either. And the same things are happening in the um, energy sector to sustain the basic commercial model of the incumbents, which is quite appropriate, that's what they should do, but there's no reason why we should collude with it. And what will make a huge difference is doing something rather than talking about it, because as the evidence of a distributed system will be absolutely transformative. And another reason why this is available to us, is just to be aware of the fact that we're kind of locked in an inappropriate phase of our relationship to energy that could change so quickly. And it's worth remembering that we basically are smart meters. Our physiology is about energy management, dealing with food, temperature, to sustain our odd um, anatomy so that we can sustain ourselves also through intelligence and dealing with uh, environment and housing and clothing and so on, we, we are energy control devices. And even in my lifetime, we still had those skills. And putting the bolster against the door to stop the draft kind of rushing in when you stoke the fire, all that stuff. Um, 
and then there was a period of de-skilling when it all seemed to be very cheap to have it all automated and, and, uh, and these very centralised arrangements. We now know that the cheapness was uh, derived from offloading the costs both onto the future in terms of carbon implications as well as onto other countries in terms of um, the uh, complexities of being um, energy producers. So we entered this kind of passive phase where we don't really control what we our energy sources and it's causing us great um, difficulty but this can change very quickly think about communications throughout our evolution communication is just something people we're energy meters but we're also playthings we're, we're, we're a key human characteristic is, is creativity and language and, and, and storytelling and creating meanings that's what we do then there's this weird period when the world went black and white and people became passive and just accepted what they were um, told to listen to. And then it changed very quickly. So that uh, Douglas Adams had to invent a new word, interactivity, for something people didn't know they didn't have beforehand. And, uh, and so that change will happen in the energy sector in the same kind of way. And it may sound a bit implausible, that, that localities can actually make an impact on these uh, uh, monolithic structures. But the fact is that the whole is made up of parts. So if the parts behave in this kind of way, the whole becomes, becomes different. So that's the kind of why we got into the energy field. And in terms of what you might do about it, Weybridge is doing its best. There's nothing special about Weybridge. There's no, there actually is a sort of history of these interests in terms of um, Goldsmiths and uh, Jeremy Fall and those 60s um, ecologists who actually started the ecology magazine in Weybridge. But there's no actual cultural resonance in Weybridge for these ideas. So it's just like anywhere. And so the sorts of things that we're doing is to make it as normal and understandable that these changes are desirable. It has to be for everybody because small numbers of people can't actually make the impact that's required. So reducing consumption is obviously key, saves money, but also that's the most efficient way of, uh, easy way of making changes. Generation is important, so we are, we've had a number of setbacks. It's because we work in a geographical area, we're limited to the um, um, ways in which we can, um, we can generate. We've procured, well, I'll come to some particular things that we've done, but, but it is still possible for us to secure this 30% uh, locally owned um, generation capacity within the period we set ourselves. And then clearly the intention is to retain those benefits locally so that people actually see why they should take an interest in these things, but it's also important to understand what's happening and why so that assertions about benefit aren't our assertions, they are um, observations of others. And so um, we don't want to add to the already too large um, mountain of unfounded assertions and that the evaluation there must be done independently so we have uh, um, Exeter University and others doing work on whether or not we're succeeding in what we're doing. And that's my epidemiological um, basic point is that and this is in distinction to for example the transition movement which is extremely important contributor to this field but the difference is that the transition movement tends to deal with the two standard deviations away from the mean people who actually are interested in these things already but that will make no measurable impact on the overall pattern of activity so the key thing is that it has to be the whole population. So the kind of things that, um, that we do, we started off, we introduced this basically as an economic program. So this is in January, three years ago, we had the just invited people to a town hall meeting. And unlike an environmental meeting where you can just get a, a couple of folks sheltering from the rain and wonder where you went wrong and why nobody's interested, the only complaint we had from that meeting was from people who couldn't get in, which was an indication that the way we presented this had some kind of appeal to it. Um, so we do have a co-op, an industrial providence society, with over a thousand paid up members. 
which is not satisfactory. We need to have everybody as a member in order for it to function properly, but that's not a bad proportion of households in, um, in the town. Um, it's one pound for lifetime membership. It has to be mainstream, so we just keep on going with um, making it mainstream and engaging with, uh, with local institutions to make it as collaborative as we can. Critical thing, in terms of membership, we've got, we've got uh, both energy ministers and members. We accept some distant members. They have, they have the same voting rights for community fund. But um, Ed Davis is a member, as is, uh, is Greg Barker. We opened this energy shop. It was a bit of a punt. We had no real resource to justify it. But energy is kind of everywhere and nowhere, so we decided it had to be somewhere so that these kinds of things would be as mainstream as, um, as other kind of town centre things, buying a loaf of bread, going to the pub, post office or whatever. And the pleasing thing is people walk past that shop now and they say, well, that's the energy shop, as if that's a routine thing, which is what we want. And the fact is it's not a routine thing because there aren't, I don't think there are many of them. And, um, but uh, that was a key um, point in terms of making it public and accessible. Um, we do put ourselves about, and that's not because we're media tasks, but you just, uh, if you're trying to do something, you've got to talk about it. And what's odd is that people in a town take more notice of what's on Spotlight or in the uh, national press than they do from conversations in the town. It's mad. So a lot of our kind of um, our big time media stuff is actually aimed at uh, local folk rather than um, distant people. There's various films. Community fund is critical so that it's seen as something generic that we're interested in whatever people themselves are interested in. And also there's a progressive aspect here in terms of of uh, drawing out the regressive aspect of the energy economy which benefits those with capital to bring that value out and for example support the food bank because it's obviously completely unacceptable that people in 2014 are, are hungry in Weybridge I mean that's just how did that happen So we work with, uh, with Cornwall Council and on these various programs I'll come to shortly. I'm on the community energy contact group, so I see ministers quite a lot. Evaluation with the university. We launched this um, Weybridge Pound, partly as a symbolic expression of keeping the value of, of these activities local. And, um, and local businesses are very keen on that. We won loads of awards, part of the neighbourhood planning process, obviously. There's about a million more pounds in the local economy than would be there if we hadn't made even these very modest and fairly pitiful um, entry-level activities into the energy economy. And that's how great the impact can, can be. And we are now forming the Weybridge Energy Company and, um, so that people can cooperatively own the local generation. Capacities, kind of kit, little, little com comparison between centralised arrangements, big six, and um, and local arrangements. The uh, the two <coughs> two seventy watt bulbs on the War Memorial were switched off some years ago because one of the big six had managed to uh, bump up the cost to nearly fifteen hundred quid. Um, and um, for £63 of electricity, which I think is one of the record-breaking uh, um, instances of overcharging. Um, and um, so the town council closed the account. That was that. The lights went out on the War Memorial. And, um, and it has to be said that trying to get two light bulbs with an unmetered supply relit is extraordinarily complicated. There's absolutely no process to do it. It actually took the chief executive of Western Power and the chief executive of um, quite a major um, local supplier to sort this out. But nevertheless, it was worth it, so we actually relit the War Memorial with, um, with, uh, with renewable um, sources. So practical things, there's um, a lot of the work we've done has been through formal procured partnerships with commercial partners. So. There's um, um, half a megawatt of PV installed in that way. We probably influenced another megawatt of PV that we haven't actually formally procured. 
Um, we've been very active in terms of renewable heat. We also collaborate with developers, so we are managing um, community benefits for a number of installations. And, um, and now we're working on that key thing, which is the cooperatively owned local generation capacity. The detail of this doesn't matter. The point is it's a flowchart so that people who just cannot work out what the options are for them to sort out their own house problems in terms of how to get help with sorting out the drafts and the insulation and better sources of heating and microgeneration. It's a complete nightmare. The disorder in this field is just bewildering. So one of the things we are doing is turning this around just to give people an easy route through these, um, these uh, um, um, complex areas and, and mobilise funds where we can. And that quote is from... I'll come back to an exhibition we did in the Autumn Weybridge Energy Futures, but, um, but uh, Tim is really good at just hitting the button. Just came up with this thing that if you can't do a town, you can't do a country. So, we, so our thing is we're doing a town. The Isle of Egg, 91 population at last count, and, um, and it was partly on the back of its off-grid, there was a, they have a big wind resource, there was a developer wanted to develop wind turbines, and they ended up with an arrangement whereby they would essentially be autonomous with their own owned energy source, and if people did not overstep a certain level of consumption, the generator didn't have to go on, and so there was a collaborative approach towards dealing with their energy requirements in this way. And then it went on to all sorts of other cooperative, collaborative arrangements across the economy and, and mutual support and so on. And people have said that that is unrepresentative of what can happen elsewhere because it's just such a small population like a big family. It just happens that the Weybridge population and yours is more or less the square of that population. So the question is, can we do it at this scale? Which is an open question. Can we be a square egg? And it just happens that the UK population is about the square of each of our populations. So if we can do it, then change could be quite remarkable. Now, in terms of neighbourhood plan, things to do, a critical insight that actually gets real resonance amongst people who are just not interested in this stuff is when they wake up to the fact that what we're talking about is actually not only normal, but was the norm for most of history. And there's this brief aberrant period when that local engagement was lost. And Weybridge, of course, like here, had its own gas works. Opposite where the, the uh, actual gas armature was, there's a row of about 10 cottages where all those families were employed that was the local economy. And, um, and that building at the bottom of, um, it's now a private house at Campbellford Road, was the Weybridge Electricity Supply Company. And we are now going to bring another Weybridge. We're going to revive the Weybridge Electricity Supply Company. And people just get that, because that was how things were. There's a list of all the different things you can get with a penny. There include... Um, uh, heat your cutting irons, so they're uh, curling irons, I mean, and there's light 600 cigars for a penny. I don't know what the cigars cost. One of my favourite quotes, it's like deja vu all over again. Yogi Berra. And of course these here, all across Cornwall, in the mid-19th century, they were absolutely cutting edge. They weren't at the edge of anything. They were at the centre. So these founders in, in Weybridge, they were winning gold. They would go off to Paris, didn't know how long it took to get there, to pick up all their gold medals for their engineering innovation. So they had no sense about being on the edge of anything. Weybridge had a railway before London. And it was used to, um, to ferry sand. So they were, these were seriously innovative, innovative people. These, incidentally, are, these are things from this Weybridge Energy Futures um, exhibition where we went through 
the energy past, the energy present, and options for the future, which I'll come to. That, again, is the, it's the poster for the Weybridge Energy Supply Company. And there's this idea of, of things going round, that, that uh, in the more distant past, all these places were largely self-reliant. There was a period of, of, uh, of local management of the energy source, but with some other other fuel sources, then those companies were basically bought up um, by SWEB and now by EDF. And, um, and so the question is, um, can one go back to a new version of those uh, arrangements? The market in Weybridge went in, uh, in 2001, but there's no reason why aspects of the energy market can't actually fill that economic, economic role. So these were questions people were asking people in, in Weybridge. Would they like to participate in what would be a local energy market and would they like there to be local generation which they would own and interestingly the, the discussion and the responses and these were just uh, the crowd you see in the co-op there was nothing special about the people we had 550 people went through this exhibition around 90% of people said yes they wanted these things to be done which is a very different impression you get than the kind of general um, uh, noise around these issues that can occur around the question of specific installations. So this is kind of idea of, of, of recreating the, the core values of the market town, which is one of the strongest human forms internationally and historically. And it's that, that, that is not an accident. It has an economic base, but also it has a it has a, a social and, and cultural base. People like the sense of fellowship and purpose and, and, uh, and cohesion and identity that comes from these kinds of um, um, forms. And then there's the issue of short supply chains, which is what market towns are about. So as much as you can, you supply everything you want locally with, with, from your hinterland or from, or from your own expertise. And energy can be part of that uh, short supply chain. Market towns, the weft, is this global reach, which in the early years of, of Weybridge was wool to Flanders, which was a long way. That global relationship collapsed, essentially. It became adverse and reverse, so that the markets were hollowed out by a different kind of global reach from food and other, um, other arrangements, which now are becoming very fragile. And now we can access those global markets without having to leave because of these extraordinary communications and, um, and other ways in which we can uh, bring that kind of um, capacity into our towns. So the interesting question is, can we recreate that kind of um, vibrancy in the market town? And the fact is, people want to be in our places. I was in Portland, Oregon once for a different, nothing to do with any of this stuff. And I was just chatting to somebody, and I could see there's all this kind of really cool techie stuff going on around Portland, Oregon. And I said, why is it all happening here? And he said, people just want to be here. And we've got that same draw. People come on holiday, but they can also come and do serious, <laughs> economically important, innovative stuff if we help them have that kind of uh, uh, capacity in these places. So distance, which was not an issue in the mid-19th century, became an issue, is much less an issue now. In fact, in many ways, it just is not an issue. And the technologies that are developing are actually about disempowering the centre. They're, they're about d disengagement and, and, uh, and uh, very destabilising for those kind of arrangements which we can exploit. It's the whole thing about the creative industries that uh, one of the major growth areas and that's clearly something that um, you particularly but all around Cornwall we can, we can major on. And one thing about a lot of these opportunities, they have to actually relate to people to make sense. People have to know about them, want to be a part of them. So the fact that we want to develop these kinds of ideas and innovations in our kind of towns which are vibrant and public and where we discuss things with each other is also a way of making these innovations work for people and that's a key part of the process and then many of us in these environments want to cooperate. Individual benefit's important but it's a car crash in lots of ways 
because cooperation act actually produces benefits for everybody. And um, I'm sure you all know about Percy Lane Oliver, and uh, that I don't know who knows that Richard Titmuss book, but the, but the basic point is the empirical study of quality in the market and in terms of product development. It's built around blood. Shows that where you marketize and individualize the process, you end up with poor supplies, both in terms of quantity and quality. You get less and more contaminated blood because the motivation for people who are donating is desperation. Whereas if you introduce space for altruism and cooperation, you have more volume and more quality. And of course, um, Percy Oliver would start, actually, interesting, he started the initial service in London with uh, Geoffrey Keynes, the brother of um, the economist who was a surgeon at St. Thomas's. But, uh, and so, in terms of if you wish to make an identity out of, out of that kind of collaborative approach. You've got a, a very good um, uh, history with, with Oliver. So get back to that kind of way of thinking about what we're trying to do. There's no values attached to looking back or looking forward or, or being peripheral or the center. And obviously in terms of things that are important to us, both ideologically, temperamentally, as well as economically, aspects of the past are clearly absolutely critical. Some of the frivolous things, fine, in terms of piscis, and then the, the deep time depth of, of, of both, both myth and reality and geology and place, all those things, as well as, uh, as the more modern interpretations of, um, of deeper traditions, that's the obvious, you can't really see the pictures here, but all that stuff. Totally legitimate. And then the question is, to what extent can we be part of a sense of being in a centre and moving ahead or elsewhere? And we wish to be. Clearly, at times in the past, I mean, the Hain steamship line was absolutely right in the centre of things. The 80-odd ships it managed to pay for. It was all around the world, major player, pre p and It was here. Um, obviously Marconi, I don't know how important that link is. Harris with his foundry in a little town in Weybridge was clearly thinking about the centre and, and the future. Um, the listening station at, um, at Bude is clearly very much part of the kind of global experience and uh, whether you want it there or not is a different thing. But, um, and, the, and the air centre and Interesting to think, I wasn't quite sure where to position Tates and Dives, because some of it is actually backward looking, and some of it isn't. And is it about being part of the, the centre, or is it about the expression of, of that kind of out-migration, which was part of the inspiration of those people who are now so strongly celebrated? And we can shuffle the tape around in this kind of... Um, uh, grid in various ways and, and Eden one can think about ways in which it fits into this pattern but in terms of our neighbourhood planning I think we're not going to do any exclusive thing on any bit of this grid but it just, when I was just thinking what to say to you I, I was just thinking how to to have a framework and I don't know if that helps or not we can, we can see what you're thinking and then the other axis which is not there is how you actually do something about these things what actual grip you've got on the world and I've said previously that the energy economy is, is something of importance so that's me so now it's you and us and whatever <laughs>